Good morning, everybody. This is Brendan Baylod from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. And I'm here with uh, my uh, my good friend and colleague, Rick Mixter from Airworthy Productions. Uh, Rick, what an exciting show we've got lined up for today. I can't wait to get going. Uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be our first presenter. Very happy to be here. The lineup's amazing. And to do something with all of us who've been sitting at home, stranded in our houses, Brendan, I think we're all in, we're in great debt to you to fill a, a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Rick. This is really to celebrate our 2000th member and to thank all of our group members for you know building such a interesting and proactive community. You know, one of the things I like about our group is you don't have a lot of trolls on here and a lot of people sniping at each other and not a lot of chest thumping about, you know, uh, no offense, all the tech diver stuff or, uh, you know, who found what, you know, it's a pretty, pretty laid back community of people who are interested in, in, in the stories of these wrecks. So thank you everybody for joining this. This is for you. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, Rick Mixter, I've known him for many years. He's uh, one of the uh, most positive, most interesting guys on the, on the Great Lakes. And uh, he's going to be uh, telling us a really cool story. I won't spoil it. Um, Rick has uh, most recently been producing for uh, Michigan Public Television. Uh, damn, I forgot the show already. Rick, it's great. <laughs> great Lakes now, but it, it, <laughs> that's fine. Thanks, Rick. And without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Rick Mixter. Thank you, Brendan, and thank you so much for the, the research group and, and this amazing way to share these stories. Uh, to have 2,000 members and the amount of time that, that you've done this it's incredible. And I know that there's a lot of people who have stories to tell that are stranded at home now. I've canceled, I think, 17 lectures already. And it, and it devastates you to sit at home and, and not to be able to tell the stories. So for me to take a Saturday and again tomorrow, I think I'm doing one on the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, online. This it's, it's no substitute for being in front of a crowd. But um, just to know that I can share stories with a, a lot of people, my, my peers, um, they can help me, I think, do research and find the things that I couldn't. So with no further ado, here's Message in a Bottle, the uh, search for the Barge Plymouth. This is based on a, on a book I'm writing right now called Messages in a Bottle. And uh, this is one of the premier stories on it. I think you'll agree by the end of it, there's it, it's like a giant soap opera. And this is where it begins. Uh, Ohio City is, is a tiny little city that's part of uh, West Cleveland. And uh, Ira Lafreniere was building boats there from the 1850s all the way on. And, and the Plymouth was a prop that, that uh, he built um, along with Stevenson in 1854. And at 212 feet, it was a you know, respectful uh, uh, steamer. And it, it basically was hauling some passengers, um, doing a lot of work from this picture, I believe, with the coal dock. This is Detroit. Um, but a lot of the runs were going to Buffalo. And the reason for that was the grain trade was exploding. So in Buffalo, you saw um, a lot of the runs coming in. Um, just because it, that became the hub that they could then get it to the railways and get it to the rest of the world. But that's what Plymouth really became. And that's where it caught the attention of, of a guy named uh, Kelterhouse, who basically was uh, collecting ships himself. He had a fleet by the time he passed away of about 20 ships. The one you're looking at right now is called the Oregon. It was built by Crosswaith in Bay City and uh, in 1882. And uh, Kelter House was doing basically um, taking ships uh, like the Nevada that was being built in Bay City as new and then recycling old parts. In the, in the case of the uh, Nevada, he took pieces of the Cayuga, the machinery, the prop, the boilers and put them in. And in this one, he wanted to save some money. So all of the, the guts to the Plymouth were taken out of this prop, which he effectively turned into a barge at that point. And, uh, and built up this ship, the Oregon. So all of the uh, propeller, the steam engine, uh, all that stuff came from the Louisiana. It worked fairly well for this ship, but for the Nevada, it was it was a complete problem um, up until it was actually scuttled. It was, a m many people believe, an insurance job when they got rid of it on Northern Lake Huron. I don't know if the owner was involved in it, but the captain certainly was implicated. But uh, this is the run you can see, they're loading up with, with lumber. Um, because this uh, ship owner had so many dealings with Bay City. I think he had three ships that were built brand new there. Uh, he somehow picked up a 16 million uh, uh, board feet of lumber from uh, Bay City that had to be moved. And that became a large part of his cargo that he was hauling around. And that's where Louisiana kind of took over uh, until it, it went through a couple of owners and then uh, ended up into the, a big storm in 1887, the October 24th storm. For people uh, familiar with wrecks on Lake Erie, that would be 
Um, huge for the Zach Chandler, which had a, a very interesting rescue uh, from Lifesavers there. Up on Marquette, there was even more trouble um, as we saw wrecks all the way from here at Presque Isle, where the, the, um, just north of Marquette, there's a giant park as a peninsula that comes out there. The west side, the uh, Chauncey Hurlbert was, was towing the Plymouth loaded with coal and trying to make it all the way up uh, the lake and couldn't and ended up sinking and unfortunately uh, uh, hung up on the rocks in a bad way. 1,300 tons of coal were there and uh, it became uh, every shipwrecker's dream to go into Marquette because not only did you have the Elva Bradley that was wrecked at Shop Point, but you also had these two ships, the, the, the two Shermans um, that were recovered. Um, the, the guy that was recovering the uh, cargo from the Elva Bradley actually took interest in the uh, Plymouth in that uh, there's 1,300 tons of, uh, coal, or of uh, coal on board, soft coal. And uh, he decided uh, that he would go after that. Well, he didn't have time because he was working on the Elva Bradley. So what he did was hired a guy that was doing some uh, maintenance work. Uh, he put all the sewer drains into Washington Avenue and Marquette. And uh, this Munson, uh, Pete Munson came in. It was actually the guy that uh, took all the coal off of the ship by bucket and then put it into to, uh, sleighs. If you look to the uh, right-hand picture, I think that's actually a horse-drawn sleigh that's taking some of the cargo across the ice. They thought that they could just batten the hatches and leave the ship, you know, till the next uh, uh, spring to do an easier um, uh, unload. But unfortunately, the storms were coming up and we all know Lake Gichigumi and it's November and December gales. Um, he figured he'd better get it off of there. The guy that arranged all this, Gillette, that was working on the Bradley, made $450 selling the cargo from the Plymouth back to its original owner, uh, Pickens. So uh, he made money without having to do anything. He went back to salvaging the Bradley, which he did. Alva Bradley, as you know, later sank uh, on uh, Lake Michigan. It's part of the Manitou Passage now. But now this became the target for other wreckers. The, the Plymouth was empty. It was sitting off of Presque Isle, and everybody's taking pictures of it. Uh, one guy used dynamite, blew up the bottom of the of the Plymouth, and uh, it was almost impossible. Impaled on the big rocks that are off of the, the island and uh, could not get it off until a guy named Jim Reed came along. And Reed is, is synonymous with uh, amazing salvage jobs. Um, every story we seem to find, especially from the 1913 storm, um, had a connection to him. He made over a million dollars in salvages in 1913 alone. Um, but he came in, figured out a way to do it, and that was by taking 1,300 kerosene barrels and putting them inside the, the, the wreck by submerging them with hydraulic jacks and affixing them to racks that he had mounted inside the ship. And then the buoyancy was let go, and it floated the ship up just enough for four tugs to pull on that wreck. Um, finally getting it pulled off, I think after two or three months, uh, they said 24 hours of towing from, I think the mocking Jay or the mocking bird, um, took the final pull in the newspaper, uh, the mining journal said that, uh, Jim Reed jumped 14 feet in the air when they finally got it off of the rocks and, and towed it along. Of course, that wasn't the uh, end of hurdles for, uh, Jim Reed because so many people had attempted to salvage this. There were a couple of, uh, lawsuits against the ship. So as soon as he got the, the vessel, uh, towed all the way to the Sioux Locks. He was met with U.S. Marshals who promptly libeled the ship and he had to pay off and, and clear up all that before he could get into the Bay City. And that's where he took it. Um, the Bay City dry dock was uh, brought in. The newspapers there said that it was the worst ship that had ever come into Bay City dry dock, that it wasn't even fit to go to the uh, to the boneyard. <laughs> it wasn't worth fixing, but eventually uh, $12,000 worth of work was put into it. That includes 3,000 uh, or three inch uh, oak planking that was on the bottom of the uh, the vessel. They also put in um, steel arches into the vessel, which in 1913 really rebuilt it, uh, in their words, better than when it was launched. So the Plymouth was refit. It looked great and uh, immediately started going into the lumber business where uh, two weeks after coming out of Bay City, it went up to Sheboygan and uh, made a run. Um, now it's advanced to 1912, a couple more owners, but the uh, Plymouth uh, is still being kept up relatively well. It had just been refit in Sturgeon Bay, I believe is where they recocked her and uh, made head headlines in the newspaper with 68,000 posts brought in by the tug James H. Martin. So this is pretty impressive. You know, the, the Menominee port was famous for lumber. In fact, uh, at one point, the, the number one lumber capital in the world was coming out of Marinette Menominee up the river was 
22 different uh, sawmills. So they were cranking out unprecedented amount of, of shingles and, and especially uh, um, boards and, and construction materials. Um, and then once the trees kind of went away, the white pine did, uh, the cedar lumber started getting real busy. And as you remember in the 1880s, there was a, a really bad recession. And by the 1910s, 1911, 1912, they were hoping that there was going to be a resurgence in these farmers that had now, you know, posts in the in the uh, farms that were rotting out that they'd need these posts. So a guy named Hubel actually went into um, really shipping, you know, getting these things cut and then shipping them in and buying just about every vessel he could find, um, including the wrecked uh, barge, uh, Wisconsin. He got the uh, Plymouth and that little tug, James Martin. Um, and he was hiring it through McKinnon and Scott, who uh, were an engineer and a captain team that were running these these boats back and forth. Well, of course, that led to some issues um, in, a, in a contract that they did. Um, there was a contract for 60,000 logs. Remember, the Plymouth was famous in Menominee and, and world over now because of that photograph of her loaded with 68,000 logs. They thought that uh, that she should be able to do 60,000 and Hubel figured he'd pay $1,000 for that, which seemed like a good price. And they went up and they, they grabbed them from, I think, Carp River and, and brought them back down. And as soon as they got in, they had, they had done an advance. Hubel had said to... Uh, to McKinnon, listen, I'll, I'll give you an advance of 450 bucks. And then uh, McKinnon, the engineer, um, Don McKinnon said, well, I'm gonna need another 250 to uh, pay the crew. So now the guy had over $600 into it, pulls into the uh, the dock, which is on the end of the government dock at Menominee. And um, right away, McKinnon says, I'm not unloading until you give me uh, my full balance of $600. Well, he wasn't owed that. And to come find out that he wasn't even hauling 60,000 logs, he was only hauling 48,000 logs. So not only was he going to short Hubel, but now he wanted 200 over what he had promised to do it. Well, it went to court, civil court, and the court said, well, we're going to put Sheriff Kell out there to watch the boat. And sure enough, the Wisconsin sank that night. So it's underwater. They came back and uh, it, it was going to be a, a big stink. But finally, Hubel paid 250 over what he said he'd pay and I got his logs and somehow came to a friendship or at least an agreement that the Plymouth would go and get a load of, uh, of logs for them up in Search Bay. Um, but the government told him, well, you can do that, but there's a, a $8,500 libel on the Plymouth. So now in order for you to sail, you have to have a member of our U.S. Marshals team on board. So a former under sheriff named Chris Keenan came on board. Now, Chris Keenan, it kind of plays into this story um, uniquely. Let, let's back up by one year, almost exactly to the year of the, the great storm. Uh, November 6th, 1912, the James Martin with McKinnon as the engineer and Scott as the, uh, the, the pilot, the captain, are towing the Hattie Wells out of uh, Chicago going towards Muskegon and they start to sink. And right away, um, Scott turns the tug around, brings the the uh, the five guys aboard. The sixty six thousand uh, board feet of uh, hemlock end up going into the lake along with the Hattie Wells, which you might have heard. I think in twenty ten is when Numa and our friends with uh, uh, the Lake Michigan Research Associates uh, found the Hattie Wells in deep water. I think like two hundred feet of water. They they went down. Um, so it's right off of I think St. Joe's between St. Joe and, and South Haven. Um, about 20 miles offshore, they found this wreck. And uh, the famous story was that that somehow this tugboat with McKinnon and Scott, and if you look on the right-hand side where it says thrilling rescue, and it says girls on the tug are brave, McKinnon had a, a, a theme of hiring teenage girls as the stewardesses and cooks on board his boats. And I say this because um, not only on, on board the Hattie Wells, but also on board the Wisconsin and on board the Plymouth, did he have these teenage uh, ladies that were on board. And he had he'd struck up a romance with the uh, young stewardess that was on the, the Hattie Wells rescue. Um, her, her name is uh, Elizabeth DeBeck and uh, wanted to marry her and ended up giving her all kinds of gifts, including uh, jewelry and corsets and uh, um, uh, stockings. And uh, the, it went sour. She didn't want to marry him. And uh, he ended up going to the judge. And the judge said, well, we're going to end up, Justice Vandenberg said, we're going to have to get those materials back. Um, so uh, McKinnon can have them. They're, they belong to him. 
And for the for some reason, the, he ordered the under sheriff, which was uh, Chris Keenan, a uh, new under sheriff, to go on board the tug and to have her give those back. Well, unfortunately, she was wearing the corset, and this embarrassment that came out again. I told you this would be a good soap opera, right? Um, she gave up the artifacts, but then countersued for the embarrassment. And of course, the jury realized this and uh, and gave her fifty dollars cash for the articles that that he had given her, and charged also to McKinnon sixty dollars for the embarrassment of having to give these items back. And then the newspaper went on to further insult McKinnon by saying that he'd already given all those items items to another girl, who I'm assuming was a, a cook named Margaret Olive, because she was the new cook that came on board for this journey that we're going to take from Menominee to Search Bay. This is going to take us past Poverty Island. And for all my friends who like stories on uh, on Lake Michigan, they know Poverty Island is famous for uh, more than just shipwrecks. And uh, we'll touch on that in a bit. But the uh, Martin had just been reboilered. They took a, an old uh, vessel and, and put a, a new boiler, a relatively new boiler into the Martin. It was woefully underpowered to be doing what it was going to go. Um, for some reason, Captain William Scott was arrested, probably tied into the story of Hubel being owed $8,500 and them mandating that they had Chris Keenan on board to guard the ship. Um, so here, uh, McKinnon has to find another pilot. So he finds a, a fish tug guy who has kind of an interesting past. I, I found an article that said that Lou uh, Satunsky um, hit a guy in the head and killed him but was acquitted of murder charges. And then he was involved in a fish tug called the J.J. Evans that sank. There was a lot of um, weirdness behind that, but it's just gonna add into the story of uh, um, really a soap opera of, of stories as they go up the lake to try to get these cedar posts at Search Bay. And here they are um, getting underway. There's two accounts. And as we talk about the storm of 1913, we know that there's 12 ships that were lost that literally we have no stories on 11 of them because the entire crew were lost. This is the one story from the great storm of 1913 where we have several eyewitness accounts, including two captains who tell us everything that happened on board because they were towing the Plymouth as they went along. The problem is the story didn't always match up and that's mostly because McKinnon is making stuff up to make himself get off of really bad charges. I mean, the city wanted to hang him basically when, um, when the entire crew of seven were killed in the 1913 storm. Um, and basically the, the, it came down to the investigators who said that, you know, the tug was in really bad shape, but you can't really blame McKinnon and, and uh, and Satunsky for it, and they just lost their license for a little bit of time. But here's the map that we put together from what McKinnon told the newspapers, um, basically taking off from Menominee at 1.30 in the afternoon on November 6th. As he's going through, he, he starts to blame Satunsky as they get up on Washington Island. November 6th at 9 p.m., he says Satunsky almost ran it into Boyer's Bluff and then turned. And for some reason, I don't know why he said this, but he said they went up to 11 mile or 11 foot shoal at the lightship and uh, almost hit an ore carrier. Now, again, I think he's just trying to point blame because this is all coming out after they're being charged with the deaths of seven sailors. He wants to really paint Satunsky in bad light. And uh, I, I just don't think that they really made that run that far north. And Satunsky didn't mention anything about that at all. Um, but they did get into the lee of St. Martin's Island, which is right at north of Green Bay, um, as you get across the Michigan line. And uh, both accounts agree that they parked there at 5 a.m. till 11 p.m. to watch the uh, storm, which was now blowing from the south. Well, of course, at 11.30, the two watchmen that were on deck came down. Everybody was on board the Plymouth eating meals because there was more room on board the Plymouth. And at 11.30, one of the watchmen said, listen, the winds are shifting as that low front now is passing Lake Michigan. Now we're seeing those winds that are flowing at a counterclockwise rotation are now coming out of the northwest. So they're totally exposed at St. Martin Island. And now they've got to figure out where they're going to go from there. So I, I think at that point is when they weighed anchor. They started to pull out. Um, McKinnon says that Satunsky ran it on the rocks at St. Martin. St. Uh, Satunsky says that never happened. At that point, Satunsky asked Chris Keenan, hey, if you want to come aboard the tugboat, you're more than welcome. They said in the newspaper they were friends. I, I don't know how far that went, but um, it, it was said that Keenan told him, I wouldn't go on that old box. I, I don't trust that tugboat. So he stayed on board where he said the quarters were much better. 
and uh, wrote on the Plymouth, which was a very fateful decision. The cook, Margaret Olive, was convinced by McKinnon to get on board the tugboat, and that saved her life. So they pulled anchor. They started to, to go through St. Martin's Passage, and by 9 p.m., um, they're, they're starting to sink. At, at uh, seven or 6.30, um, Satunsky comes up uh, below and, and puts the uh, wheelsman on. He tells the wheelsman, hey, uh, watch out. I've been thrown out of the wheelhouse twice in this storm. So hang on to the wheel and I'll be right back. He goes and tells McKinnon, I've got to cut the barge, lo barge loose. It, it's in much better shape than us. We're sinking. They had six inches of water in the bottom of the tug. And uh, uh, McKinnon agrees. So they signal three long blasts to the tug or to the, to the barge and the, the barge doesn't respond. So they slow down a little bit more, and by seven o'clock, um, Satunsky gives three more blasts on the horn. They notice two crewmen run up on the, the barge and drop anchor. That's a 3,500 pound anchor that went down, and they cut loose. The line went slack, and the Martin took off. In the waves and the wind, they said there was not even a possibility of talking to the men on the ship. So they turned around, they ran all the way up to the UP to hide from this storm, figuring that because they left the ship, by McKinnon's account, it was a mile under the Gull Islands that you see on the map here. By Satunsky's account, it was three miles under the Gull Islands, so a little bit lower, but still within the lee that they thought would break the waves. Uh, Satunsky and, and McKinnon both mentioned that as they went by Summer Island, there was a schooner that was a third of the size of uh, Plymouth and it was weathering just fine in the gale, they figured that it'd be fine. And in two days later, they came back to look for the tug or the barge and the barge was completely gone. And we really didn't know anything else about the storm. They, they came back to Menominee, they did not go back out. They asked for the Tuscarora, the, the revenue cutter to go look and uh, nothing was found except for an oar that was located on St. Martin Island. Here's a picture, a painting that Jim Clary did. He was one of the first guys to paint all of the 1913 storm victims. Um, Jim, we just lost to cancer just, uh, I think, two years ago. Um, fantastic maritime artist and, uh, and the first, as I said, to really show us what it might have looked like in that in that gale, uh, just as they cut it loose, a very solitary you know, thought of throwing that anchor down and then being stuck out in these waves um, off of an island where they can barely see uh, uh, in the storm, I'm sure they could not see Poverty Island light. Then a bottle washes ashore near Manistee. It's a message from the Plymouth that says, uh, Dear wife and children, we were left up here by uh, McKinnon, captain of the tug at anchor. We went away. He went away and never said goodbye or anything. We lost one man overnight. We've been out in the storm for 40 hours. Goodbye. I might see you in heaven, Chris K. Now, this is interesting because uh, it, it says they were out there for 40 hours. That means that they had sat in the anchor um, well into that Sunday. And it's possible that they could have gone back if the tug had been back, you know, before Monday when they did go back. And a lot of the people in the city, when they saw this, this was really bad news for uh, McKinnon and uh, Satunsky because um, it proved that they they might have been able to save these poor men, except for probably Ed Johnson, where this says we lost one man overboard. Um, we'll see in a second here that uh, that his body was recovered. The, there was a second note that was in the bottle, and they were the one was written on a coal receipt. And this is how it managed to get back to them to know what uh, what story it was. The coal receipt was to the the Plymouth, and it was to McKinnon and Scott. So um, it was mailed to the uh, Western Coal Company, who then mailed it to Menominee, um, and it made its way to Keenan's family. It, the, the second note said, Hubel owes $35 so you can get it. Goodbye forever. This is money that was owed for him for being the custodian on board the ship, you know, for taking care of it. And now he's reaching out from beyond the grave, if you will, to, to uh, claim his money. Very sobering thought. And probably one of the, the biggest stories that I've seen on the Great Lakes for messages in a bottle, this went all across the nation. Only the Christmas tree ship um, made as many headlines as I can tell. So two of the biggest stories of, of the messages in a bottle on the Great Lakes, um, for sure. Now, if we put everything together, here's what, what they did find. Ed Johnson was found in December up at Platte Bay. Um, Chris Keenan and the bottle were found near Onekama. There's no real great location to show where the bottle or where the, the his body was found. Keenan was wearing a life jacket and he had rope around his waist, which uh, led a lot of people to believe that he had tied himself to the mast of the ship. 
um, to prevent himself from being blown away. But unfortunately, when the ship went down, he did. Captain Axel Larson, who was a captain by name and certainly uh, had papers, but um, was really just a lumber inspector. So out of these crew members, um, maybe two of them had, I think, uh, Cossack and uh, Duchesne had experience. The rest of the seven or the, maybe the other five guys had no real sailing experience. So um, really devastating for a team that might have been able to put up a sail, but probably couldn't. You know, that's not something that you can do as a volunteer. You've got to have experience, and especially in a storm, um, I think that they were really left to the to the waves and the wind, and, and there was no chance for, for being found. But if you look through that, all of my, my wreck sleuths in the audience – you know, this is a good outlay for where the debris was found, you know, where the, the sad uh, loss of the crew were found as well. And I think that, you know, this sets up a, a good explanation that she probably did drift at least a little bit into the middle of the lake. Remember that she had mass over 90 feet high. Um, so it had to have gone a little ways past uh, Gull Island where the water gets deeper. Um, that's where we figured that that ship would be. So you can imagine my surprise when uh, when I heard that it was found elsewhere. Before I get to you know the, the people looking for the ship, I wanna talk a little bit about McKinnon because our soap opera doesn't end with the sinking of the ship. The investigation happens in Marquette and basically, um, basically they talk you know, about the loss of, of the ship and how the tug was in bad shape. Um, the investigators call up Satunsky who shows up in Marquette and tells everybody, you know, this is my version of the story, what happened. They call up McKinnon and McKinnon says, I can't come to Marquette. I don't have any money. I, and it's 120 miles. I'm not going to walk. So come and get me if you want. And this went on for a postponement over, over a month. And finally he shows up and uh, they come out with uh, um, Satunsky basically, you know, threw himself on the mercy of the investigators and said, you know, listen, I was on board. Um, I, I, I didn't have the right license on board. It turns out that he was only um, registered for fish tugs up to six, 600, or 60 ton, and the, uh, the Martin was 74 to 80 ton. Um, he was not licensed to go anywhere into Lake Michigan, only northern or Lake uh, Huron, where they were headed through the Straits and into Search Bay. Um, so he basically got off with a year suspension. But it was uh, because I think of McKinnon's attitude and because he was the guy, the owner of the tug that hired this guy. Remember, the, the pilot has to put his license in the ship. So he knew that, the, that he wasn't licensed to be able to go into uh, Lake Mich or Lake Huron. So I think that that's really what got McKinnon. Right away, they banned him essentially for life, uh, not to be able to get a license again. But I think that with enough appeals, McKinnon finally got... Um, his license back, and he started to sail for uh, Lethem Smith. And uh, this is one of the old ships he was on, Adriatic. This is um, very, very late in her career, but um, he got on board this ship and had a big fight with uh, the owners and threatened to throw them overboard. And the sheriff again got involved in uh, in another co uh, court case, and uh, he was fined and and got off. And that's all I ever heard from McKinnon again. It's still going to take some research to figure out what happened, unless you do a, a genealogical search, which I did, and found out that he got married, and that I found this newspaper article um, based on his marriage to the the woman cook that was on board when the uh, the ship sank. The James Martin. He said in this article um, that Olive, uh, Margaret Olive fell overboard and he saved her life. I don't know where that came from. I think it was just because, as you can tell by the headline, Cupid writes the sequel of the storm. I think he knew the direction of the article and, and could basically steer it the way he wanted to go. And uh, it says he married the, the cook. And uh, if you look at the very bottom of the first article, it says uh, performed by Justice Vandenberg, which is surprising because Vandenberg was the guy that was involved in the whole Debec story where, you know, made uh, made the under sheriff Keenan take the undergarments of Debec. Um, so it, it's kind of funny that he saw full circle in all these stories. Um, it'd be interesting that there's nothing in genealogical that says that Olive and McKinnon had any kids. Um, and I'm still trying to find pictures of Chris Keenan. I did find some of his family up in Alaska of all places. He had kids all over the place. Um, <clears throat> so we really don't hear, let me take a drink of water here. We really don't hear much about the Plymouth after that. The newspapers will have um, many, uh, you know, especially the Advocate and other papers have uh, um, anniversary stories about it. 
But in 1964, there was a story about an old World War II diver. I think he was from the Korean War, Art Reitz. And uh, he was talking about the Poverty Island gold that he was searching for and how he found the wreck of the Plymouth. And the article goes into great detail about how they almost lost their boat in the story and stuff. And it, and it reads really, really well, you know, for a, a cliffhanger of a story that they found a shipwreck called the Plymouth that was involved in 1913. And then they went in to recount all of the story of McKinnon and stuff and talked about how much research that Art had done to prove that this was the Plymouth. And he said, um, not only here, but also in the uh, 1969 Art of uh, March edition of Skin Diver, how, um, the Plymouth was just a couple of yards from the lighthouse. And this really set up, you know, a, a surprise for me because um, he, he said he did all this research. I actually called Bill Barada, who wrote this article. He put me in touch with Art Reitz. So we talked for some time about, you know, how he discovered that this was the Plymouth. He said he did an airplane flight over the island and uh, saw the outline of two ships that were there. And uh, I think he just did rudimentary research, which with all the newspaper headlines about the Plymouth, it was no surprise that he, he thought that it would be this 200 foot long schooner uh, barge that was lost up there. I asked him, did you find a capstan cover? Did you take a measurement? Did, no, 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 no. He just, you know, they, they took what they could from the wreck and brought it up and uh, and that was the end of it. So no definitive proof that it was ever there. Ever there. So imagine my, my surprise as I tried to figure out Okay, look at the bottom of the map where McKinnon claims that they anchored it. Now, Satunsky said it was even two miles farther south. How is it possible that the Plymouth broke loose from a 3,500 pound anchor and then drifted against 60 mile an hour per hour, you know, per hour winds that at one point those winds were raging for 16 hours straight. And then it somehow without any sail went against those winds and wrecked on the island where a lighthouse keeper had been stationed until 1957. So within eyesight of the lighthouse station, which none of the logbooks from that mention anything about seeing the wrecks or anything. So I don't believe for a second that this is the Plymouth, that it, it, it absolutely can't be. And, and the, the fact is that with the wreckage, it probably sank even further out, especially being 40 hours into the storm when it raged um, into probably Monday, which would have been, I believe, the 9th. So imagine my bigger surprise when I went to my, my public library in Milwaukee and uh, realized that somebody wrote, discovered in 1984, so now we're talking about 20 years after Art Reitz, and it's 500 yards from the lighthouse at 220 degrees. It put us right at the spot where we think it could be. Art Reitz said there would be three big rocks that we could line up with. We went out there with our boat to take a look around and um, try to find it and to see what they, what they were looking at. Um, when I did go out there, I went to Washington Island, that's where we launched from, and uh, found this giant rudder that was sitting there with a plaque that said, from the Plymouth, you know, seven men lost. Um, they really believed that because of these articles and this information at the library, that this was the Plymouth. So this is the repercussions of stuff that comes out of, you know, a ship that people just assume that it's that with no definitive proof at all and really not much research. So, of course, we had to load up our, our big expedition uh, in the raft is Ron Bloomfield. And uh, this is the only way to get to uh, the island at Poverty. Poverty Island is is a real tough stretch. Um, even in the time when lighthouse keepers were there, they had to build a pier to go out uh, past the rocks. Uh, all of that pier was destroyed. Again, unmanned in uh, 1957, uh, the lighthouse fell apart and they ended up just kind of pushing the lantern right off the top of the lighthouse. The lens ended up at Sand Point in Escanaba, um, but it was broke open. In the article, they talk about how they went inside the lighthouse, the door was open. Um, this would be in 64, so it was almost a decade and a half uh, after they had um, abandoned it. And they said there were record albums in there and stuff. And so that's all been picked over. The wrecks out front largely picked over. And we started taking some measurements on the at least the shallow wreck that was found there um, was a good chunk of a wreck that was over 150 feet long, but it was scattered into many pieces and clearly had been salvaged that there had been cargo in this and it had been scooped apart. So again, there's no way that this was the Plymouth because of the wind direction and because of where it lied. The measurements proved that it wasn't even close to the 212 feet. 
Um, and as we looked around, uh, you, you couldn't tell much from the wrecks, but it started to line up with some other stories that we can find on Poverty Island, including the Dick Summers, which they again put it right at the lighthouse. They talk about uh, 500 tons of ore, which uh, are 650 iron, uh, iron ore um, uh, nuggets were in it. They ended up scooping that out, um, a cargo from Escanaba that uh, 500 tons were recovered. That really fits for what we're kind of seeing there. The wreckers log log on the right hand side telling us about the summers and how they scooped it out and uh, what was recovered, the divers that went in. So I'm thinking that much of the wreck that we saw, especially in, at that depth, was the Dick Summers. But what about the deeper wreck that Reitz had talked about in almost 90 feet? Well, that lines up really well with the Erastus Corning, which is another vessel that um, it's just in a deeper section. I haven't seen all of the parts on that. When we went out there, the only float that was out there was for the the, the one that was more inshore. This one was listed as being in, uh, I think, 16 fathoms. It was towed by the Romania and uh, broke loose, ran right up on the island, uh, very close to the lighthouse. And uh, the lighthouse keeper was the guy that salvaged much of the wreck, taking much of the things that were off of there. So I think that uh, the divers found the pieces of the Corning in the summers. I don't think that they ever saw the Plymouth that was down there. And uh, that leads us, you know, to, to the obvious question is where is, you know, that, that wreck that we went out um, about a mile from Gull Island. You can see the islands right here. Uh, they call them Gull Island because the, the gulls have, uh, with their defecation all over the island, have stripped the entire island down. There's nothing on them except for, you know, a couple of sticks of dead trees. But you can clearly, um, from the distance, see what's left of the poverty on the lighthouse. Sadly, that's one of those lighthouses that's so far out in the middle of nowhere. There is a group that's trying to save it. But at this point, I, I'd be very surprised. You'd, you'd have a million and maybe even more into uh, trying to recover it. And, uh, and then who could go see it? I mean, it's so far out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I don't know what you could do. We did a search thinking, you know, why not we uh, look around for at least a magnetic anomaly. One of those anchors is going to be out in that approximate location. Um, and we ran, you know, so just a fish finder to see if we could see anything. And, and again, not very good patterns and didn't find much, but at least start up, you know, a new conversation for where that Plymouth could be and, and to excite people like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eliason and uh, these guys that they go out and they can find it. They, they know what to look for and, and to see the, uh, um, the, the success that they've had, th this will probably be left up to them. My only hope is that uh, I can share some of this research and, and get a, a dive on it, or at least if it's deep, you know, to, to do the, the final chapter on this wreck because of the 1913 wrecks, um, this is one of the last ones. Uh, it, this one and, and really the Lee Field, um, which I know that they've been looking for up, up off of the uh, Pick Island, um, this and the Carruthers, you know, as soon as they find this, those chapters will be over with. So I think for Lake Michigan, this is one of the, the big ones that we hope that will, you know, the, the, the big finds. We always make fun of the, the word Holy Grail. You know, the big <laughs> Griffin story is, I think, the one that everybody's looking for or hopes to find on Lake Michigan. But Plymouth, to me, I think would be uh, equally important. And, and just from the stories, I mean, it, it, it's an amazing um, story that I think there's still stuff to be researched. And uh, I call it the rabbit hole as I do this research. I told my wife, every time I change a channel um, uh, or, or another part of the story, I find more information. And that information leads me to another part of the story. So will I ever be done telling this? Probably not, but I'll be looking. I know that, uh, Brendan, you've actually been taking uh, notes for people. If there are any questions or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to uh, to, to share, um, you know, my knowledge, at least for what, what I know. I've basically shared everything that I pretty much know. But uh, why don't you jump in, Brendan, and tell me what uh, what's going on? Well, thanks, Rick. Great talk, by the way. That, that An amazing soap <laughs> opera story. I had no idea that there was that much intrigue and... Uh, you know, scandal, frankly, behind the Plymouth loss. So what a wonderful story and uh, amazing research. Mostly what I'm seeing in the comments is just, you know, what what tremendous research you did to put this all together. Um, wow. Um, I don't see a lot of questions. Please feel free to ask them uh, if you want to know uh, anything from Rick about this. Um, so, Rick, uh, just uh, from my uh, curiosity, the Plymouth, you know, clearly hasn't been found despite, you know, a lot of uh, claims to the contrary. 
Um, how big of a search grid do you think there is for her? Do you think she's uh, going to take a lot of side scan work? I, I think it will. I mean, honestly, you can start from the easy stuff and, and do a much better job than we did. I mean, I can't even say that we started a search because we just went out there. We were doing some dives. We thought, let's just pluck around and, and see in the approximate area. So it, it would be start from scratch. I don't think anybody's really looked. I, I, there's a barge that they found up there. And other than that, I don't think that there's a whole bunch more uh, research that that's been done beyond that. And, and that, you know, add in the fact that it's out in the middle of nowhere. Only today's gas prices make me excited to think that we could go out and search. If it would have been $2, $3 a gallon, um, I don't think that it, it'd be a good time to go and look for it. But here we're looking, knock on wood, I hope the, the prices stay halfway sane and we can, you know, get in and do some searching because you could go 10 miles from where it, it was reportedly left and still get into a pattern that would put, you know, Axel Larson uh, washing out that far. So I, I think that it, it could be huge, but you could also go in depths where you figure the masts are probably still standing because no debris was found, although they, I'm sure they could be alongside the wreck as well, but um, <clears throat> really not much was found. And, and with the people that were out searching, especially Tuscarora, um, I think that they did a pretty thorough search uh, for debris on the islands around the area. The hope being that, you know, a lifeboat cut loose and that these guys were, were safe someplace. And unfortunately, that wasn't the truth. So 16 hours at anchor. And then uh, they do you think there's a chance that they broke free and, uh, and were driven well out into Lake Michigan before the vessel went down? My guess is he would have put that in a note. I mean, he had time to write the first note. There's two notes in there, one being very hurriedly written um, that said, I had another man write this for me. That was the the you know postscript on the note. Um, but the first note um, authenticated by his family that that was his handwriting said, you know, basically goodbye, I might see you in heaven. He would have said, we broke loose, you know, we're drifting. I think just to at least try to, you know, uh, put some semblance to, you know, where to find them. Um, the last one, taking the time to say that Hubel still owed him 35 bucks. You know, again, I think that that, that was a very, he knew it was over for him at that point. I, I think that you, any detail like that might've been added in, but I think up until that point, they probably stayed pretty well, you know, at the, you know, there, but if he had tied himself to a mass, that was, you know, the last ditch effort to, uh, to try to save himself being up on the water and then, you know, with the young guy going over early, they found him in Platte Bay. That makes sense that there was further up in the lake. And once it broke loose, he didn't have time to write another note and, uh, and was lost. So I think it drifted probably not, you know, as far as, as, uh, cause he, I think he's at 40 hours in the, in the storm. Um, I think that they stayed at anchor for that amount of time, but that again, complete guess that these things, you know, it's so intriguing because you've got this message, but you really can't read too much into it because, you know, there's no way to know what Chris Keenan was going through in those hours. Well, what's interesting, Rick, is that the search grid for that has never been searched that I'm aware of, and it doesn't seem like a really big search grid. And, you know, for our listeners who think, well, wow, there's a search grid that's never been searched. It's not really big. We well, should go out there. There are many wrecks like that. The reason that they don't get found is because they're very remote. And a lot of people talk about going out to remote areas and searching for shipwrecks. It's a big expedition. And I can't tell you, and Rick, you know this, how many times you array everything at the dock, you get all the, the side scan, you get all the food, you get all the beer, the whiskey, the you know other things that are needed for a, a search like that. And then the weather blows you uh, blows you out. And then you're stuck there at the uh, harbor drinking it all uh, on land. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And to know the remoteness, too, to go out there and not see land anywhere that you're at, you know, and to know that there's no real safe port. I mean, you've got to literally leave from Washington Island or, you know, you can go all the way up and come down Fayette. Um, the ghost town that's up there or the very bottom of Garden Peninsula. But then you still have to go around Summer Island. There's a bunch of shipwrecks up there, too. And um, most people, I think most of the divers from the 1950s all the way to the 1990s only looked for things that were in less than 150 feet of water, you know, maybe 200 feet when you saw Dave Trotter doing a little bit more as people got more into mixed gas diving. Um, you didn't, nobody looked in this, you know, if it's deeper than that. So we're now starting to see with uh, Elias and Merriman and, and other teams going into deeper water now with underwater cameras. And now we're unlocking, you know, 500 to 800 feet of water um, for these shipwrecks. So 
I think it'll be found eventually. I, I see somebody popped up a question about the E.R. Williams. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably far away from there, too. And a good story, too. Uh, E.R. Williams being in the same storm. If, if you're familiar with uh, um, St. Helena Island, the, the wreck of the C.H. Uh, Johnson, which has those massive uh, uh, redstone uh, um, uh, sandstone blocks on it from the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, that big storm ripped the back end of the E.R. Williams. That's closer to St. Uh, uh, Martin's Island. I'm not sure who found it, but it was turned over right away. It's right on the state line for Michigan. So it was within, you know, uh, the Michigan uh, protection. It's a great wreck. The bow is gorgeous. I dove on it. Um, it's a really, really neat wreck up there, but I'm not sure who might have found it. Uh, Bob Jake just chimed in. Uh, Bob Ducro, uh, the late Bob Ducro, really, really nice guy, a uh, good friend of ours who uh, died far too young. Oh. Uh, Bob's collection was recently donated to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. Uh, so, uh, yep, he found the E.R. Williams. Amazing. And, and our hats off to him for a premier shipwreck at a reasonable depth. You know, we have in our Great Lakes amazing shipwrecks that, you know, anybody can dive, uh, you know, as we look at the shallow stuff like a C.H. Johnson, all the way to some of the deeper things, you know, within sport diver limits, at least for for most of the people like me. Um, my hat's off to the divers that'll go 200, 300 feet. Um, I just, I, that's good submarine depth for me. And, and as I get older, as the gray gets in my beard, <laughs> it, it becomes less and less of a possibility for me to be swimming that deep and, and to spend the time that I think is necessary to, to do the research that's down there. I mean, I'm looking for minutia to try to tell these stories and you can't do that in a 15 minute dive. But uh, for those people that are doing it and bringing back images that quite frankly now, Brendan, make my jaw drop. I look at uh, the stuff that uh, Jansen, Skulls, and especially Becky Schott are doing. I'm just blown away. And and with the new generation now coming in um, uh, with Dusty and so many other people that are, are getting toys and, and, and using their amazing artistic ability to showcase these wrecks with faster exposure times, um, better cameras, and better visibility. <clears throat> Our Great Lakes um, literally fantastic opportunity now to showcase although we're seeing a lot of clam pictures which is is really a, a, a scourge on our trade-off from great visibility and the uh i remember dry diving the the price from 1913 and seeing two zebra mussels on the shipwreck and now it's completely coated and uh, you can't even see metal on that rack so um it's amazing how much it's changed just in my short time those were the days. Well, Rick Mixter, thanks so much for uh, a wonderful talk and, uh, frankly, new information that uh, I think uh, is going to uh, have ripples around the Great Lakes from this talk. Uh, what a what a wonderful and well researched talk, Rick. And uh, uh, from you, that means a lot. I just have fun doing it, and for me, it, it's about finding new stories. And, and maybe digging up some of the old ones that maybe weren't told correctly <laughs> and uh, and finding some of that. Yeah, so we'll, we'll continue to do that. And as long as I you know have a, a wreck and there's what, six, 7,000 wrecks out there, I'll keep doing it. it it's fun, it, it's nice to share them. I have a great venue to do it on PBS, to share these you know with millions of viewers, uh, to write magazine articles and to do stories. So I think I almost have a, an obligation, if you will, to, to, to showcase these stories and to tell the true stories. There's a, I, I see a lot of stuff about gold and I won't even start to get involved in that. But um, I think that it, for me, there's so many amazing stories on this Great Lakes that, that are true, that still take your breath away and still scratch your head far beyond fake stories of gold. I think that those are the stories that require our attention. And, and again, if you find a wreck in the case of the Plymouth, don't go to the media go to a historian, go to somebody like Brendan, go to a state underwater archaeologist like Wayne or, or Tammy Thompson. And these are the people that you need to share this with first, then vet it out to make sure it's correct, then go to the media. 90 different griffins is ridiculous. And, and it, it puts shame upon, you know, the people who are doing great research. So please, please go to an archaeologist. These are the people that can help you not look silly and, and then tell the story. The journalists are just doing their job. They just want to go out and tell a great story and they could care less if it's real, if it had a steam pump on it or, you know, that like in the case of the Griffin, couldn't have been the Griffin. And uh, a lot of us are just scratching our heads as to why they do it, but it's because they don't have time to vet the story. They're just going to run with it. Well, Rick, again, what a great story. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and uh, again, you know, the Arcanters just came up on the beach up on the, on the shore of the UP. 
And my hats are off to the finder. He contacted the Michigan Maritime Museum. They reached out to Valerie Van Heest at uh, Michigan Shipwreck Research Associates. And Valerie and company put together a great story because she's named after Rokas Cantors, one of the mayors of Holland. So it fit right in with them. And and it was a wreck that I had been researching too. And I uh, really was really pleased that they were able to share that with the public. Uh, so uh, hats off to MSRA and uh, the big article on MLive this morning. Rick, thanks so much. We're going to take a short break before we come back with Chris Roxburg. And uh, Chris is uh, one of our favorite people on the group and uh, a guy who's bringing in people into the Great Lake Shipwreck community that that we don't normally find. A lot of them aren't divers. He's reaching out to segments of the of the community that um, you know we're seeing that that we didn't used to reach. Younger people and a lot of them just sort of casually interested. Uh, and he's kind of a kind of a social media influencer these days. So I was really happy to have Chris come on and join us. So uh, hang around, folks. Chris Roxburgh in ten minutes. Uh, well, Rick, thanks so much. Bye bye. <laughs> 